Are good? Yes, oh, that sounds like it's coming through. Hello, hello. Okay, we'll get started then. Um, so welcome everyone to our Innovation Week edition of Connected. This series features discussions between academia and industry at Melbourne Connect with the aim of transforming our ideas into more than the sum of their parts. First up, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the traditional custodians of the unceded land on which we gather today, the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge First Nations people as our first artists and scientists and further acknowledge their pivotal contributions to the Academy. I also like to pay my respects to elders both past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be present today. So our topic today is AI and analytics. Does it make education easier? So our two speakers will give short presentations, then ask each other some questions before throwing to a couple of audience questions. We'll then rinse and repeat with a longer audience question time, and there's also a chance at the end to chat over lunch. So I'll introduce now our two speakers. Um, we have Dr. Eduardo Oliveira, who's a senior lecturer at the School of Computing and Information System at the University of Melbourne, currently holding the prestigious University of Melbourne Gem Scott Fel a Teaching Fellowship, Eduardo's area of expertise is in the use of artificial intelligence to model and assist tertiary students on digital learning environments using machine learning and natural language processing combined with models of self-regulated learning. Eduardo is particularly interested in understanding how tertiary students learn independently and how and when we can best support them, supporting tertiary students' technical and professional skills development through evidence-based explainable AI, and exploring the use of authorship verification and academic integrity. Our second speaker is Dan Ingvarsson, who's a strategic advisor at IntelliSchool. Oh, that's just one of the many hats that he wears. Dan has a long career in technology innovation and has been at the vanguard of the integration of technology and education even before the arrival of the internet. He's a software developer, company founder, solutions architect, integration specialist, consultant, and policy advisor. He's made globally significant contributions to safe internet access and effective online learning for school students interoperability in education, and most recently, school-ready AI systems. He moved between advising, business, governments, and national philanthropic organizations on edtech, interoperability in the global edtech market. You will basically find Dan anywhere that there is an intersection between educational technology and educators working on the best ways for emerging technologies such as AI and analytics to support teachers. And I believe that Dan will actually be speaking first, so I'll pass over to you now. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. That, that, that intro was fantastic, but that's why I've got grey hair. Uh, they've been around for a very long time. Um, uh, and I'm really pleased that you were doing um, the authenticity of, uh, of assessments. So I'm going to talk to you about that also. A little different. That's a slightly different topic. So I'm, I'm starting with this concept here about what's important in data analytics uh, and teaching. A little bit out loud. Oh, there you go. That's better, isn't it? Yeah. So um, uh, there's a whole lot of data in education. Um, we, uh, you know, sometimes are swimming in sort of data. So uh, the problems often uh, are not: do we have data? But is it in a form that we can use? Is it in a form that we can make decisions from? Is it a form that the teachers can make decisions from? Um, so we, we hear about this thing called database, data-driven data decision-making. And fundamentally, that's a, a, a way of trying to create a feedback loop where we get information based on what we've done previously so that we can make a better decision next time. But that also assumes that we're able to, to go through all of the mechanics of this process. So the first thing that I think AI is going to be uh, helping us with is a set of the mechanics that currently teachers and uh, often data scientists, scientists in schools and other people have to do so that, that was the wrong button, so that this is a list of examples of some of the stuff that, that is involved in that sort of boring process but fundamental process of getting the data in a form that we can make comparable long-term analysis uh, from uh, which has got sort of validity to it, 
And we're looking right now at ways of making that process far more automated. So what does that mean? It means that we're going to be able to get more data from more places. We're going to be able to compare that data to see whether things line up or don't line up. So does when attendance changes or behavior instance changes, does that align with students' grades going up or down? Um, the work to do this currently, sometimes schools can't afford to do it. Uh, and so AI is helping us with each one of those kinds of steps. Um, and that's because this is uh, a chart that tries to put where do we currently put funding when it comes to learning analytics. Turns out we put the money into all of the red areas, which are the technical steps. The areas where teachers m uh, use analytics effectively is the light red box, and we don't put nearly as much effort there. So the promise of what we're doing is being able to take the investment that we put into those red boxes currently and reduce those costs, make it simpler, so that we can put more investment into helping teachers actually make decisions and make change. So that looks a bit like, you know, this is the, if we like, this is the database decision make, data, da data driven decision making for education which is actually called the Data Literacy for Teaching Cycle. You can look it up, it's a research-based cycle. Um, I can't pronounce her name, the, the woman who's, uh, who, who has put it together, but she did a meta-analysis of all of the, the, the ways that schools are using uh, analytics and data, and basically dis were, as was able to distill out these kind of steps, and then able to say what do, what, what do people need to be able to do in those steps to make uh, high quality, uh, um, uh, actions for each of those steps and what we're doing in uh, at IntelliSchool is looking at those and seeing how can we automate those and make each one of those much much simpler so it's basically can we make the data into inf information so what does that mean so in education we know some of the stuff that may w that actually is more effective so we've just talked about being able to make the data more available but there's another step the teachers have to know what to do with that as a teaching practice. So just because a line is going up on a chart doesn't tell you what is the kind of thing you need to do to change the directory of that line. So we have to align, we have to align the desired effects that we want from teaching and learning with the information that we're getting from data. And currently that's really, really complicated. So I'm going to talk about some of the ways that we're doing that and some of the, the projects that are, uh, are involved. So there's sort of four things, formative planning, formative assessment planning, assessments, and being able to, to now measure more th of, uh, w widen what we value because we can measure more. So on formative assessments, uh, what we and I think this is what you were going to show. Basically, is is is, uh, is uh, we're much more able to create create the instrument, the quiz. We're much more able to deliver that quiz, and we're much more able, able to create a simple visualization that's appropriate for that particular topic. And we've also got lots of tools that are coming that you can just go and use online that help you put those things together. So we're lowering the barrier for formative work. But this is the one that actually I think is going to make the biggest difference, which is where we're working on a project with Melbourne University to take standards-based progression information. That means things that we can make comparable between students, between schools, and over time. Um, and so we're getting a map of, if you look at the down in the literacy and numeracy uh, on the right hand side, we're getting a map of the description of the skills that the student is strong or not strong in, where they are in these particular areas. Uh, then what we're able to do is the really tough next step. We're able to, t we're actually, we're, we're, uh, we're working uh, on a project with someone I can't mention, but that to look at their teaching and learning strategies information 
and uh, using Gen AI, because it's good at language analysis, to, com to link those two things. So we've got wh what they're weak at, and then we've got a research-based research, research based resource about how to teach this particular skill. And so we're able to actually give the, uh, uh, the, the teacher, when they're doing their planning, a, uh, a, a link that says, th here are some ways of teaching this kind of skill so that the, the teacher is able to give a, a, a much more personalized unit plan for tho th those, those, those students. Here's another view, uh, view of that, where we're actually able to drill down into exactly in reading, grammar, numeracy, spelling, the exact items that the students are struggling with, and then are uh, uh, able to align that to this research-based database to give the actual st steps that will help that particular cohort of students. This is what I think the future is, though. So we keep saying everything we've talked about now is about what we can currently measure and what, the, what, what is important uh, because we measure it. <laughs> it's, where, it's where we look. We don't, we're now, uh, one of the reasons this is close to my heart is uh, I'm not very good in English. Uh, I, uh, matter of fact, I can't spell. I barely write and barely speak English. Um, that's my first language. And uh, that's, that's just not my skill. So it meant when I was measured uh, to, to finish school uh, based on having to write essays, I didn't do very well. Uh, and so this is a different way of being able to say, well, there were other things that we can measure, and now we're being able to sta start to measure them well. However, they're a truckload of work to measure, There's, and teachers are already overworked. So AI, I believe, is the, uh, the path for us to tri try to create a broadening of measures of students' capabilities so we can start to appreciate their approaches to work, how they go through the process of, going, uh, of, of approaching learning, not just the end measures. So I think that's where I'm just going to leave it there to being able to say, yeah, th th that all of this is trying to look at how we help people move around this particular data literacy for learning cycle. Thank you. I'm a little, a little trepidatious. Did you take notes? I, I, hello. I try to. <laughs> Your English is very good and fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love your work. So for those who don't know me, um, thank you, Laura. I'm a, I, I work here, CAS, um, AI and Education. But I've been um, trying to collaborate with Dan, and we always bumping into each other. The other day I told him I was driving. I could hear him speaking on a podcast and then the day after we attending a summit together and meeting here and so on. So um, I'm a big fan of your work then. Um, thanks for sharing this. Um, I love the scale of IntelliSchool, that are how, c how you able to reach out to, there's so many layers of complexity rather than just even talking about the analytics and AI to, as you said, for example, to help with data-driven decision-making, how to support the feedback loop. Once you get more data, how teachers can make sense of that. But I'm also keen on policies. And for example, one of the things here, we have Spark AI at this university, and we have our own large language model that we're trying to protect our academics, at first academics, for, from issues related to data confidentiality, privacy, and so on. And when you're doing things at scale and you're customizing and you're personalizing and you're going to this cycle and this process, um, how do you reach out to, for example, schools are quite, uh, wh what's your feeling now? How are schools receiving this? That, that's part of my curiosity. Like, we're talking about teachers, we need to educate them, and we need to educate ourselves as well in data literacy, AI literacy, and all of this change. But 
What's happening at um, government level? Like, is this IntelliSchool and tools like AI and assessment, when you talk about measurement, do you have metrics in place to explain those to if someone contests algorithm um, um, decisions and so on? What's happening in this field? So we are still very much driven by the standards-based assessments, NAPLAN, ASA, the PAT tests. Um, and there's a reason for that, which is that those tests are a reasonable proxy for intelligence. Uh, so they allow us to rank and to do what we were trying to do with those assessments, which is rank you into university. There is, however, that additional uh, uh, undertone that's happening, which says that's not really helping the kids learn. That's just assessing them at the end. Uh, and so there is a recognition that we need to, to evolve that and that there was actually there's, – there's been projects to help uh, – uh, quantify a, a, a national formative assessment project so that the, uh, the, the that was put that was invested in it was recognized it was needed so you're right the, the, the policymakers recognize we need to be doing assessment for learning rather than just assessment of learning and uh, however it was a bit too complicated and a bit too bureaucratic and now they've got another option so the ability to use AI uh, to generate personalized questions, personalized assessments, and personalized feedback much faster, giving is giving us the promise of shifting the uh, the the where we value from just the end product to uh, things that that people are doing in the process. So there is there there is a likelihood you'll see that project again raise its head now, and just to go to the large language model problem, which is we aren't wanting to send kids data overseas. We, we, so, and we're wanting an, an Australian-based uh, version of the curriculum. And so there's a recognition that at some stage we'll have to address the needs of a large language model for Australian education. Um, uh, no direction completely understood, no, you know, taken, but a, a recognition that we need to make something more particular. Thanks so much. Just to, to give a bit more of context. But anyway, um, we didn't plan the questions, right? So it's all like here ad hoc. But can I ask you, um, and, and what's your take like when we're talking schools, teachers? Um, I personally come from engineering, faculty of engineering and IT. And one of the things that I see is sometimes I'm sitting on the table um, with some other people from IT. And I feel we need some other background sitting on the table to discuss AI in a more holistic way. And what I'm saying this is when you talk about te uh, teachers, policy makers and students, I also can think a lot about inequality. So not everyone is having access to the same technology. So some students have access to the best large language model, they can afford paying for that. They understand what AI is, communicating with a machine, making sense of data, and so on. They put themselves out, they trial, they learn. The same with teachers, the same in our space here. I'm running a hands-on workshops for, for our staff on Gen AI, and some of my colleagues have never used Gen AI or, or AI. And so, is that something that is also taken into consideration? What's your take on this and what are the gaps and what we can do to also um, tackle this issue? Another great question. I'm not going to be able to, able to ask you as good questions. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, who here has not played with Gen AI? One, two. Okay. So that's you know there's the, the, the they still exist, but I think it's a diminishing uh, uh, return, and this is probably be for this this particular answer. So just on the access thing, when we first put internet into schools, um, uh, it was uh, only uh, through grants and expensive schools that were able to do it. I now think that uh, in Australia, with uh, some of the satellite coverages, etc., they now have a hundred percent of schools. It did take a very, very long time, 
um, uh, for that to occur. Uh, but hopefully what we will find is that in the age of Gen AI that uh, it will be made more accessible by two things. The first is this, do we run our own Australian education LLM? You know, you know, the, 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 you know our, that's a still a few years away, I think, but you know, the, the, it, with the progress in open source models, I think that that's big, is big increasingly becoming a, 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 an option. And the, and the second is, we're creating these LLM wrapper layers for education. So I'm involved in an AI test lab where we're giving out access to schools and we're taking the, the uh, standard GTP, Anthropic, or I should say Claude, uh, you know, uh, um, Gemini, um, uh, the, so the different models. And before we send a student's uh, query to it, it's going through a set of processes it's being de-identified and then being sent off to those items. And that layer is being managed by the uh, Catholic Education Network. So that's making it available to like 20% of all Australian schools, which is one service that's being put together. So it's addressing it, but it's going to take time. It should be open for... Does anyone would like to... Uh, would have a question for them? Thanks, Sam, um, for the chat. Really enjoying it. Um, definitely acknowledge there's a big need for this in e education, but there's often the challenge that um, schools are a tough channel to achieve scale in, given that there's the sort of split between the buyer and the user, with principals having the money, but teachers um, wanting to be the, the user of that. And then also with government being a bit of a lagger of um, leading technologies. So how do you plan to kind of um, overcome that to get this into the hands of as most people as we can? So uh, the, 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 the kind of go-to-market that works in, in education is sector-specific. That means it's different for government, different for Catholic, different for independent. Uh, so in the government sector, they are funding their own LLM uh, projects. Um, and I expect them to do deals with Microsoft or Google and provide this sort of office-based uh, productivity s suites, uh, you know, that have been wrapped, like we were talking about, uh, you know, to their schools. That is currently occurring in South Australia and in New South Wales, and I think it's in, you know, it's it's, it's in a percentage of, you know, of like four percent of schools now. Right? So it is it is it's not, but it, it but it will be done by the government. I think is what th is what I'm going to say. Independent schools, they're not going to have the 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 scale to do that. So they'll probably buy tools from. Uh, uh, you know the the tool sets that are out there. The Catholic scale sector is the in-between one, and that's the one I'm working with, which is tr isn't big enough on their own to do what the government systems are doing. But in combination, they create this shared uh, environment. And you know, just to give you an example, uh, a teacher c can create a, uh, a, a, a we call them a practice, which is basically a, a prompt with with context information. Um, and test that out and let's say it's for creating a homework assignment that's, that's engaging for their particular students. And if they find that what they've done works, they can then share it with the next teacher who can then mix it, fork it, create their own version of that and create a kind of, of, a, of a network where the teachers are building the, the prompt types and sharing them on with one another. That goes for prompts and it goes for chatbots as well. So if you remember the GTPs, you know, they're being built and shared as well. So expect that the, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the, that the user will be g empowered to create their own prompts uh, from libraries of other kinds of prompts that, that have been created so that they're not having to do it all from scratch each time. And hopefully the best ones rise to the top. Thank you. Employers have been com employers have been complaining that students and graduates lack the generic skills, the 21st century skills, such as critical thinking, logical reasoning, problem solving, mm -hmm. emotional intelligence, abstract reasoning, and so on. Yet nothing has changed. 
there are many reasons for this because it's easy to teach content. For example, 99% content and 1% generic skills. The opposite, 99% generic skills, 1% content is extremely difficult to teach and difficult to assess. How can AI ever hope to do anything about this? Thank you. Uh, two, two, two areas. Yep, firstly, you have to, to, to agree on what good looks like for critical thinking or for these other components. That slide that I had up at the end, that is a, uh, what we call a psychometric construct uh, uh, framework, which allows us to judge if you're in school A and you're in school B, whether when you're doing critical thinking, that's comparable to what you're doing. Right? So that is the first important thing is to value those skills, we have to be able to measure them. And to be able to measure them, we've got to be able to define them. And that framework is the first step towards doing that. And it's a M University of Melbourne uh, project that's been running for many years and it's research-based. So that comparability, comparability um, and it means that we can say, are you good at it or are you not? And therefore it becomes valuable. The second part of that is it's too much work. A teacher to do it is too much work. So that's where the AI comes in. So you need the, so the sound grounding of the measure as, uh, associated with tools that mean that instead of uh, teachers having to know how to measure all of those things, we can create instruments that they, through their normal uh, observations of students' progress, are able to take those measures. And so then we have a side of being able to get the data on how students are going about it. Um, then we can do something about improving it, because until we can measure it, we can't do anything about it. We can probably do one more question before moving on. Um, did anyone else have something they wanted to bring up? Otherwise, there'll be more question time at the end. Oh. <laughs> Just uh, another question. Um, when you reflected on your strength not being in, in English, but then you also obviously have strengths in other areas, and I was interested to understand your approach to providing students opportunities for strengths-based development rather than just looking to equalise all their weaknesses and how you've built that in as well? Well, that's the toughest question of the day. That's a really tough question um, because it, becomes, it comes down to the fact that our, our classrooms are not structured for differentiated instruction and unit planning is not, uh, is not structured that particular way right now. Um, and so uh, the... There is a, there is, a, it was actually on one of my slides, there is a promise of being able to create assessments, you know, student assignments and, and the co coursework that is differentiated. And I, I'm actually working with a school that's doing that now by combining years. So students aren't in grade or year blah, they're at progress point blah. And they can, they can then go as fast or, or, or as slow as they need, um, you know, in those particular areas. Uh, and AI is being used to try and create personalised, well, it, it's not personalised because you can't teach personalised, there's just too many students. So it's to, it to, to create differentiated levels that are associated with the year and the student and the progress through the year um, uh, uh, so that, that um, you've, got a l you've got a level that is both teachable because the teacher standing up the front of the classroom, of, you know, can't, you, you can do, you can do, Two or three levels. If you're, you know, if you're a high quality teacher, well prepared with all the resources done for you, that's the uh, that's the sort of aim that, that that you know you could potentially get to, if AI is doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Can I comment? Um, that's a very good question. That's also um, I have a PhD, very keen, and uh, it's very challenging area. But to me, also, uh, I don't work with schools. I work with higher education. But what I see, for example, first year computer science students, um, especially at Melbourne, uh, Melbourne Uni, I'll speak for Melbourne Uni because that's where I research, they come with different background. And it's a major shock, right, that first year, there's a lot to unpack. And sometimes what we do over and over is like a factory system that we teach everyone on the same pace and to be at the same level of expectation. 
And there is an acknowledgement a lot more now, and especially with AI, that what's your goal and why are you here? It might be that you were extremely experienced and you were like working in the industry and you just came now because you need a diploma. But you're not here to master that. You're already mastering in your field, but you want just to tick that box and get that. Nothing wrong. Some other students, they want to master that. And some are in my subject just because that was the only option available. And it's perfectly fine. We don't have to have everyone at a H1 level. But how do we allow for you to set your goals, to monitor your development, in order that also you can adjust your learning journey to achieve your goal, which is unique from another a thousand other students in the same subject. And now for the very first time, we can do this by using instruments and tools like AI, in which we can allow you to self-assess, to monitor, and to customize assessment and assistance so there is heaps changing, but this is an area that um, it, it, it's quite new. So even when you say like the curricula and, and how you change curricula and layered education, you go, you get doctors and doctors train with doctors, but then they go out and they're working with nurses, patients and so on. But they don't get that exposure during the course. How do we allow for, if we use using AI simulations of those environments as well, to meet them at different levels, different. So there's a lot. And I think f finally, at least, we are at a stage that we can consider this at scale. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, I had some slides and demos and stuff, but I'll be fast and furious because I also didn't know I wouldn't use my computer. So I had to convert everything into PDF. So I won't be able to run my demo. But one thing that was quite interesting to me is one of my PhD students is a learning designer and his skill is not in data or analytics. And the other day he showed me a graph with, with code and he did analytics based on a very complex spreadsheet. And I'm like, did you do it? Like, yeah. I'm like, how did you do this? You can't code. So he literally used code. He got a spreadsheet with the data and he got a, a picture of the dashboard and he said can you make something making use of this spreadsheet to look like this graph and i want to be interactive and i want 18 points of interaction based on 18 different months and he did that in one prompt and it generates and that's what i was about to show and you can click publish and i could access that immediately so now, after that experience using Cloud AI, I started using more interactive activities with my students. In fact, we're now playing um, snake games and pub trivia that I generate on the go at lecture time. So it's fantastic. Anyway, that won't happen, but I can share with you later. We'll, we'll bring these guys in. Yes, um, this is not um, changing from, oh, here we go. So I'm going to skip some of this stuff, AI and education, analytics. That was a fast and furious, super demo quick that now you had to visualize. But I'm happy to share with you if you send me anywhere. I have the prompt and the spreadsheet and so on. It's fascinating. And that's to show that we now can do analytics, even though, even if we are not data scientists. Now, I'm not doing as cool stuff as then. But that's part of my own research. My master's was in AI and education, my PhD, my postdoctorate. And I had two large projects, one with eSafety, that it's still happening. And it's AI education analytics. It's, um, uh, to, it's a platform to detect online harassment and to protect young women on social media. That's with eSafety. And another big one with NDIS. Um, but one that it's, uh, I wanted to showcase just a few. One, it's called IntelliJourney, and I didn't know about IntelliSchool in the past, so it's not a copy and paste. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because I was working with Dan's wife, and we, we, we did a bit of brainstorm to find a name. But it's basically the idea that you asked, um, can we provide and assist students and develop students' personal competencies that are not technical? So if you come to me, and I used to be course coordinator and you say hey 
what subject should I course? Sh should I add as part of my study plan? I'm like, hello, who are you? I can't tell you that. That's your future. Now, I didn't know how to ask students in a different way to help them making a guide on what they should be learning. So one day, one of the students said, this is where I want to work. And they showed me on SIG a position, a job position from Amazon. So what I did was I mapped the technical skills with the subjects that we had, but I wasn't able to map many of the professional skills, leadership, critical thinking, responsibility. So that's where IntelliJourney started coming in hand. There is a way for you to self-assess, set your goals, and then based on that, we create a collection of dashboards based on how we believe you are behaving online, and then we show you your score, your own score, and our score. But we want to do it in an evidence-based way. So we do learning analytics, we explain our rationale, why we use a rubric as part of this instrument. So we collect online behavior, large scale, hundreds and hundreds of metrics. We process them, we build models, students' models, your way of learning, my way of learning. We allow you to monitor that, and we expect you to self-reflect. So now we've used this with over 2,000 students. It might not see wow at the scale of, um, but it's pretty interesting and it's showing results. And we focus specifically on professional um, development. Each of you will have your own trajectory. Um, we also have a project uh, with AI and analytics here in which we compare students' online behavior on different subjects and what are the factors that are impacting um, their commitment or involvement or engagement with the different subject. If a student has is high self-regulated learning, has the same motivation for a particular um, subject, the subject, however, is structured very differently. Will that impact on the engagement online? I don't know, yes or no, to what extent? So we're measuring those who are tackling um, some subjects in a very intensive way, light way, and reasoning that by looking at analytics, online behavior, and AI. So this is a paper that um, it's another PhD student doing. And what we're trying to do now, so we ask them at first, we ask students, why are you here? And then we look at online. But now we're trying to exclude the survey as part of this process. Can we pick what they're doing, their motivation and goals just based on online behavior? Because we did the mapping between survey and online behavior. So to give an idea on the scale of this, just a PhD. And we're just looking into two subjects, but we looked at over 400,000 clicks to build our very first toy models. Um, and then you can see that some people, as expected, will be having like an intensive way to tackle one subject, but not the other. Some will be intensive or targeting. And why is that? Oh, why my student is so bad here? Well, it's because my subject is just a pass and fail. It's not part of the goal of that student so we try to understand and make um, um, a reasoning behind those behavior why we do this just so we can assist people individually but at scale so that's why analytics and ai another interesting one is we looked at we started looking at reports from hundreds and hundreds of students they are all my students in software engineering we started looking at the writing of those students and what we did was, how are our students writing? And I looked at their reports in 2020, 2021, 2022. And what we did was, how do they write? How many rare words, complex words, long words, simple words? How their vocabulary develop from one semester to the other semester? What's the na an average speed rate of that writing skill development? And then we added, ChatGPT, allow them to write reports using ChatGPT, and then we compared. Now that they have ChatGPT, how is ChatGPT impacting the way our students are now communicating through writing? 
So we built the models and you can see things like this, for example, in 2021, 2022, uh, on the left side, you can see that there was a lot more, or this was just semester one, like unique words, very steep density, similar words. The moment you add ChatGPT or large language models, then you can see that it's spread around the number of unique words that they start using, it changed significantly. Now, what that means for us, if I know the average speed that they should be developing, can I assist them with language development? Can I consider customizing, um, it's like too technical here, not too technical, how are they developing this? Later, what I haven't done and I want to do is how this translates into oral communication. We're not at that level yet, but we're now tackling um, the writing. Now, what we realized while we were doing this is that we started understanding a lot about the words that were coming specifically from AI. So then we're like, hey, let's build a model and identify AI. So we started building accuracy models to identify what's coming from AI, what's coming from students based on our own data. And then as an accident, the accuracy started being really good. We built the model, we had good data. And now what we're doing is, I personally am a believer that all of us will be working with AI. That's the dumbest version of AI we will ever use. From us, from now, just get better. Now, if we understand that we'll start working with AI, I don't care if students will be working with AI. I'm working with AI, but it's how they're working. One thing is to delegate the writing to AI, the other is to write with AI. And for that, we've been talking, and soon also, maybe we're not even gonna be typing anymore. Everything will be audio based. Anyway, we're not there yet, but if we can understand what's coming from AI, what's not coming from AI, then a natural research question came to our, on, on our radar, was like, all right, so if we understand we're moving into hybrid space and students can start writing with AI, can we try and measure the collaboration between humans and AI? To what extent that report was written completely by AI or completely by the students or to what extent was 20, 80, 40, 60, and then we started doing this. And then we started testing with public data sets that were um, labeled, tagged, and testing, testing, testing. It's a gigantic piece of work that um, has been really fun to work, but AI to assist with monitoring and development of language, authenticity verification, measuring the process, the collaboration between people and AI, competency tracking, and a lot more. Um, this is another one that we've been using AI to help students do code review. So I integrated ChatGPT, OpenAI API um, key with uh, GitHub. So it's a GitHub action, fully automated, no change in workflow. And students, once they submit things to GitHub, if there is no issue with confidentiality, data privacy, and so on, we train students, we do AI literacy modules in the classroom then it goes to AI and within 10 seconds maximum, students get feedback on the quality of their code. Now, I'm not asking ChatGPT to fix the code because going back to the question here at the front, I believe AI is doing um, um, bell curve, average things, and I don't want students to do average things. If you're a good writer or beginner writer, novice, for you to get to the level of Shakespeare, it takes time. But for you to speed from novice to medium with ChatGPT or large language models quite quick, and that's very tempting. Is that good enough for you to remain there? And it's the same with coding. The thing that I also don't want is those who are at genius level, very good programmers, but they take a lot of time to get the things done. Should they now start delegating? Should you compromise quality for speed? So that's why we very carefully providing feedback that continues to challenge the critical thinking aspect of AI. AI working and being part of the process, not delegating things to AI. Um, now, conscious of time, there is a new research starting this week. I have a new PhD student here with me and he did a gigantic work in Brazil 
uh, involving item uh, response theory. And we looked at 1,200 schools, look at Dan, he's paying attention to that, 40,000 teachers, 700,000 students. During pandemic, these people had to move online. But look at the piles of exams that had to be marked. They had to be sent to different assessors. Now, you are all one student, but when you have 700 students marking this, you could potentially take your feedback back to you six months later. That's not efficient. So AI here to automate things at scale, but considering different models and what's the best model for the best type of exam assessment and so on. So another gigantic piece of analytics and AI happening here. And so I think I'll finish here just saying, does it make education easier? I think it depends. Easier is not always better. I would say critical thinking, as you we pointed, 21st century skills, they are indeed very important. I would say the true value of AI and analytics lies in how they are used. Um, they can be employed to enhance creativity, critical thinking, personalized learning, making education not only easier, but also better. Timely feedback at scale. Knowing all of my 1,200 students that I have per year, to a level that it's the granularity is so, so, so small, I could never think like that before. And now I can. So, but I have to be careful as well. There is a lot to consider. We don't know exactly where to go. We don't have a map, we have a compass. We heading towards some direction and exploring things as they are happening. So that's why it's so exciting to come here share a bit of this research, which I don't know if they make sense or not, because we're just trying to learn from all that has been happening. Um, but my last slide, I'd say whatever you do and whenever you have conversations, remain in control. Human in the loop. I'm not a big advocate for replacing, delegating. I is doing a fantastic assessment. I don't need to do my work anymore. I wouldn't do that, right? So um, productivity for me, doesn't mean getting more things like, I don't want AI to allow me to do more work. I don't want to work more. But I want to do things that I was doing at an ordinary level with more quality. So I've been using AI to improve the quality of the feedback that I'm providing, the assistance to my students and so on. So that's where I believe the technology can um, be positive in education. Thank you. Isn't it great to have him here? Wonderful speaker. Gosh, yeah, so very kind it, it, and polite. Oh, it, it, it's so engaging, Eduardo. Uh, and um, I find it interesting that we both ended on the critical 21st century <laughs> things without. We, we didn't collude that. So there was the. You know, we, 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 we all. It uh, was already there. So. Yeah, it was. So you was you're spot on. Uh, uh, so, look. Um, there were so many questions that I, 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 I wanted to, to ask you, but I think I just I just want to start with a kind of like um, go go back to the the coding example that you gave. Just doing something quite quite sort of specific. We all know that AI has a tendency to do a, as good a job as it knows how to currently, given what you tell it to do. Uh, that basically means garbage in, garbage out is still, you know, it's it's still a thing. You ask a poor question, you'll get a poor answer. Um, and when you're asking things about assessment, there's quite a lot of considerations. There's a lot of considerations that are outside of just the test and the results that you're getting right there. So I'm interested with the rubric on the coding. How did you go about getting feedback and, and, and making that actually representative? That's a, such a good question. Thanks so much. Um, one of the chats that I had here last week with some people, Provost, Chancellery, was like, but do you, if you allow your students to use AI, do you know how you're going to assess? Do you know how you're going to measure their performance? Do you know how to structure that? I'm like, oh my gosh, no, 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 I don't know. And they look at me like, so why are you doing? And to me, there is also... One, for taking risks, but two, not all learning, in my opinion, has to be through formal learning. 
And I feel like there is informal learning is so important. For example, if you don't want to have a chat, uh, 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 an ITS, an intelligent tutory system, or a chat board in your subject because you don't have a clear design on how that will be integrated within your subject and your process and your educational methodology, could you allow them to chat with stop one chat board to ask about the services at uni? And you're like, but what that has to do with your subject? It's informal learning. They are talking to a machine. Th sometimes they want to get the, ra the real answer, the answer they want. They will try differently. They will prompt differently. But they are exposed to the technology. So my way of doing that particular project was I went to the Faculty of Education. Can you help me with this rubric? Is this a good rubric? That was step one. Is this research-based? All right, so I have something to tell my students. The second one, not exactly a Socratic model because there's no conversation, but I don't want to give them the answers. This is right, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is how you fix it. But we have issues here in Australia like cybersecurity, performance, and so on. And I have an accreditation body that was asking us to introduce this to our subjects. Now, I've been asking my students to do code review in traditional way, which is you sit together and you look at the code together in a big screen and we take notes on a spreadsheet. I need to send you what you need to review in advance. I need to book 48 hours in advance when to meet. I need to book a room. Then we meet together. Then I document the, the, the issues. Then I get back to you. I did the issues. Then you review that I did, and that's the end. They don't do it. Now, even if it's not perfect, they are doing. So in three years, six offerings of the subject, only eight, eight students did code review. We're talking about a thousand students. Now, every semester, a hundred percent of the students are doing code review. Now, what I ask is, I don't know if it's good, bad, but you show me what you got as a response, reflect on that, document that and that's what i'm assessing so, so, so it's, it's the process and what they process. do with yeah. that correct because yeah. i don't know if my rubric is good enough if i'm missing on something but i want them to feel like what are the limitations in the use of the technology the strengths and to allow them in a very structured way responsible way to walk this path together with me so uh, that reminds me uh, just back to d my presentation we were saying that 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 it, in a way, being more impactful with the choice of what you're trying to do with data is more important. Uh, and so that what w it's, a, it's an alignment between K-12 and your own courses. If the students are doing things that are uh, actually more engaging and they are actually involved in processes that, that we're not good at measuring at the moment, but we know are good because research says they're good, maybe is the measurement the most important thing um and then it comes back to the 21st century schools at the end but i'll go but i, I will go to the to to because you started to ask that, that my second question uh, and so um now that we have ai we can use it for small amounts of uh, activity so a brainstorm some research uh some planning some brainstorming some ideas uh, structuring a paragraph. Um, well, look, I, sh I usually start by saying spelling because that's what I need, right? <laughs> spelling, grammar, and they're all the same. They're all methods of assistance. So within assessments, there are levels of assistance that uh, is okay. And we're now, it appears, shifting what the levels of assistance in a se is, is appropriate. Do you have any ideas for what to give those measurement guys that want to actually, however, know that we're doing well, um, for more uh, more um, complete use of AI. So, so if we're going and saying a student, uh, a student use this uh, to help them plan. Let's just take a plan structured outline and imagine f f there. What ways do you think we might be able to uh, uh, give a a rubric for measuring that. What research is there for that? I don't. I don't know. Yeah. I don't have an answer. Brave for that. new, brave new. It's, it's pretty tough. 
Yeah. What I all I know, all I feel now is AI strained on uh, AI strained on data, lots of data, in a very sophisticated, smart way. But I want more for my students. I don't want them to rely on that engine to, for example, delegate a planning to the tool and don't come back and build on top of that. And critical think, oh, where are the anecdotes? Where are the where is the empathy? Where are the and, and the things that are human that us humans can do and that I still feel that's the difference of what will be an ordinary um, kind of student and a student that can use AI to build on top as part of that creative process. But how we leverage that, how we level up that kind of skill, it's something that hopefully the PhD students will figure out for me and teach me, but that's something we investigate. It's all pretty in the air for us at least. I could keep going, but we've only got a couple of minutes, so I might let you throw to the audience if there's any. Yes, so audience questions. So s thanks, thanks for your, your, Thank your you. telling my excellent on the code review example, right? And also you mentioned about and um, then the, uh, for those uh, beginning learner, right, it's uh, easy to use that kind of AI tool like ChatGPT to go up to the middle level, right? But right, you spend less time, do it. And then my question is come to the personal learning, right? I regard myself as a lifelong learner. And then how do you think use that kind of tool? It's easy for your past your, your subject, right? But how can that kind of AI tool can be transformed the people learning habit and become their own strength in terms of education? That's another excellent question. I don't have all the answers. So as I said, no map, just a, a compass. What I'm trying to do now is my subjects, I might be lucky or not, depends on the perspective, but my subjects are all project-based subjects and I always work with real industry partners. And why I'm saying this, they are authentic and they are complex, they are large systems. So if you consider, I don't know if you follow, if you like it or not, but the Bloom's taxonomy, we operate in that high order thinking skills not at the level of understanding and so on. So for me, that's an advantage. Students come final year and they pretty much apply and at the creative innovative process of that. So AI might give them a start, but it won't get those software developed. It won't be a creative software. They can't at the moment rely on that. So for example, learning designer, my PhD student got a spreadsheet and image, could create an interactive data, he won't be able to debug that or change anything. We still need people, and we will always need, that are extremely focused on data science, learning analytics, deep learning, and I don't see large language models replacing this knowledge. So there's a limit at what is the mediocre, and I've heard someone saying, chat GPT, it's a magnet, <coughs> sorry, it's a magnet for mediocre work, and I agree with that. If you want to do ordinary, like bell curve, right in the middle, then you will do it. But to get this, if you're talking about code, the stack overflow, the most polished version and sophisticated solution for a particular code, that won't come from the large language model. And I think students need to acknowledge that. Where do you want to sit with this? What's your goal? Are you just cruising along, ChatGPT will help you, or do you want to master this and you have to do a lot more of work for yourself? So I think that part of motivation, it's also something that we can't just say it's AI or anything. It's like, what are the personal factors as well and how we support that to, to shine? If someone is here just to cruise along, there's nothing that I can do that will take them out of ChatGPT. I feel like that. I'm not sure if I make sense, but that's my belief. So it's like, it's, it's, it's complex, yeah. Uh, hi, Eduardo. Thanks for your talk. It, it was great. Um, so my question is, in your opinion, how can we motivate students to work with AI instead of, you know, uh, letting them to generate the content? I think, it, yeah, you already answered uh, kind of that. If you know the answer, please come back to me because I've tried giving them free coffee, cookies, bringing guest lectures. Look, the thing is, 
I might be very motivated, and I am, but what if I got a new job this semester? What if I broke up with my partner? What if I was moving house and I'm so tired, I have no energy left? So sometimes you can go to scale and people say, yeah, of course we can measure motivation. Of course I'm like, can we? On a daily basis to see to what extent personal factors are now happening and to what extent that is interfering the commitment of those students that have nothing to do with you and your approach. So that's the hard thing that to me personally, when you're doing things at scale, AI could potentially help. If I could have data from my students since undergrad and now at master's level, and I can see the patterns, how they are, and I have a kind of understanding. I also surveyed at the start, what's your goal? Why are you here? What's your motivation? And I match and I backtrack who that person is. Now if I see something going on off track, I can act. Right? So I can say, hey, I can see you pretty good student and this and that. And you're like, you know my name? You have 5,000 students. I'm like, I know you, Jordan. I know you, Willie. It's like, that's what I think AI could help. But it's not for us to design for all. I don't believe in such a thing because we're all in different journeys, different times in our life. So it's pretty hard. If, if you remove personal factors, from this, it's pretty complex. So I don't think it's all like, come, everyone, H1, I'm doing my best, you should do your best. Your best is just coming and showing up to the that day. So it depends, that's my take, but AI could help you. If you have a great model, lots of data, then that's what I feel like, where are the red lights? Where are the yellow lights? Where's the green light? Yeah, that's what I think we could do, yeah. Okay. It's so, so nice to have questions. I feel that AI or LLMs have been biased towards helping students produce work which meets the medium level and to mark, but it hasn't been um, as just as um, productive for assessors or educators to assess it, whether it's their own work or the work of uh, assisted AI-assisted work. So in some ways, I feel that it's been irresponsible how AI has been made, LLMs have been made so accessible and it provides a disincentive for students to do in the bare minimum when they are under pressure to pass. So when will we see AI LMs being used to be more interrog interrogative and automated in assessing student work to assist educators who have been behind the eight ball for all this time? <laughs> I, I just want to clarify, w was the question, when will we be able to detect that students using AI, basically? Never. No, and and going worse, so uh, that that it is now it is now going, uh, you know. Uh, so authenticity, or yeah, sorry, so authorship certainty. So if basically, what you're talking about there is assessment security, uh, because otherwise, if you can, if if you now on your phone can just go take a picture of the 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 uh, uh, assignment and and say give me the answer and put it in the 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 there is there's, there's there's only one way which is that you watch the student produce it themselves so you have to have a mechanism for for effectively turning every assessment into a high stakes assessment which is why i say never so the the the, the alternative is what we call that's called lane 1 assessments Lane two assessments is where we utilize AI in a, in a proactive way to assist certain uh, learning aspects. So when I, when I talk to, I interview lots of students uh, in, in VCE or HC, HSC and ask them, how are you using AI to help you, you know, get a good grade? And they're like, well, uh, I, I, I know that I have to learn Otherwise, it's going to come out of the wash at the end. Of the, at the end, so what we talk about is having checkpoints, so that there are there are some of these lane one ex exams and tests that are checkpointed against other lane two assessments, so that the students know that they've got to try and achieve all the way through. But because we try and normalise across different assessments, and we're able to start measuring different processes of learning, we can get a more holistic picture. But you're never going back to a point where you're going to be able to tell that you know was this done or not. I'll give you an example. Student uh, uh, pre 
put in a piece of hand-drawn art. Turns out what they did was they, they, they got the AI to uh, g do that. They printed a copy and they traced it and they handed it in. So there's these AI, AI air gaps that you, know, you won't be able Can to... Can I, uh, uh, just on that, like, I'll, I'll be a bit polemic, like, because to me it's more like, and to what extent, I think it's all context dependent as well. Like, for me, um, I have students international that they're doing masters or PhD, and not always, like, the writing skills from their native language will translate into English. And so I see a very polished version of their writing and I ask them over and over and they know everything to the point that one day the student, I was like, did you really write this? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They opened over leaf and I could see hundreds of editings. He used Grammarly, he translated and then all the collaboration was there. Now I give it back to you. If you could see the traces of how they use the AI and you see also the final product would that change your perspective? Like, so the problem is not using AI, it's to what extent and how we've been collaborating with AI. So to me, if we haven't understand that things will become hybrid, that's what I'm trying to think ahead. I'm like, I don't wanna be doing paper and pen. So if there's that acknowledgement, how can I assess differently? How can I design my assessment for like learning? And, and so there is a lot of things to change, but anyway. I can and I do not as an educator, but I'm saying the tools are not there for no, the no, no, they high not. school yes. and university yes. level teachers. Yes, yes. So They're coming. I teach software it engineering and computer science topics. Yes. So sh what was previously essays or short question yes. answers, I basically have to redo. And yes, I agree. You do? I agree. Yeah. There's a great paper by Philip Dawson called Validity Not Cheating. Like that's what we should be looking for: validity of learning, not not looking for for the cheating. Because if we look for cheating, d are we successful if we find more cheating or find less cheating? With What's with more successful? <laughs> with all respects, your earlier answer suggests that that is an impossible task, and, and I kind of disagree. I think it is possible, with what um, you've just said. You know, there's a way to check the the process. And, and encourage the student to do you know more work to reach the uh, customer. I, I agree. So we do it, and my area is authorship verification. So since 2016, the issue is still sometimes like with when you turn it in and you get a percentage is to what extent there is post positive. And that's where I, I concern, like how can we, for example, when I have a student that it's um, flagged, how can I initiate a conversation for something that was highlighted without knowing the details about the process within that model that was considered to highlight and say that. So we can do, but the challenge I think is the follow up. So what we're trying to do here with my students, and I still do, we break that down, we get the features, we expose, we explain, but that's not really natural for everyone. Like when you look at the statistical models and the numbers, you can try to make sense. And so to what extent we can translate and explain those processes from vendors that will not tell they are because of IP, like I'm not gonna tell you exactly what's happening. That That's what I feel the tension is. I agree with you, we're doing, we use that, but from my own experience, I'm always uncomfortable to follow up on those chats because of this. It's like it's showing me. If they say no, I didn't do. What else can I do? What if what if it's a mistake? And these models make mistake, and that's where I'm like I'm stuck. So that's where it's happening at the moment. I feel a lot of people trying to figure these things out. I don't know if that makes sense. Just my own experience with this. Yeah. You're right. And that's what happens. Put a case, show what you did, bring everything, and then let's discuss. That's exactly what happens. You're right. Okay. Yeah. And just looking at the time, so I think we've gone a little bit over. Um, but yes, please stay, have some lunch, and yeah, chat um, some more if you like. But I guess, yeah, did you guys have any final thoughts to wrap up or any final messages? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And yes, please join us for some food. <laughs>